Hello hackers! Welcome to Pwn College. I'm Jan and today in this video we're going to be talking about uh, registers in assembly. Alright, we talked about data in the previous video and uh, CPUs love data, they process data, binary data that is interpreted in various ways that make sense to us. Um, now, a CPU needs somewhere to store that data, short-term memory, if you will. If you imagine data as money and the CPU is handed a bunch of money, it might put it in a cash register, right? And a, what is called in the uh, computing world, the register file. Now, the register file sits right inside of the CPU and holds a bunch of registers. Um, and basically, data flows from system memory into some various caches. Uh, unfortunate name collision there with cache register. Maybe it's not a great analogy. Um, and then into the register file where it is used or it flows directly from the instructions into the register file as we will talk into registers. All right, what are registers? Registers are fast places to store data, right? They are meant for uh, very, it's the only place that the, C, the CPU can typically, uh, that's false, it is uh, the typical place to store data for a CPU to actually interact with that data to make oper to do operations on it, to do computation on it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. They are extremely fast, they're right in the CPU and so there's not a lot of space for them, they're very expensive to make and, uh, and uh, so there's very few of them. Um, depending on the architecture, if you were living way back when, when Intel gave the world the, you know, 8086 or 8085 even, we had just, just eight of them, right? In fact, just seven. Um, nowadays, we're much better off. AMD, when they expanded Intel's x86 architecture into the 64-bit x86 architecture, also known as AMD64, in their infinite wisdom, they gave us an enormous amount of uh, registers, uh, which we can use to store data and do computation. There are also a lot of, uh, of like special registers, um, registers, for example, that store the address of the next instruction. We'll talk about that uh, in a future lecture. Um, and then other very, very fancy stuff for multimedia computation that I mentioned in a previous lecture and we'll probably never really talk about again. Okay, so um, registers live in your CPU. Um, they are the size of the word width of the architecture, typically, right? Again, exceptions abound. But on a 64-bit architecture, most of your registers are going to hold 64 bits. That is eight bytes of eight bits each. You can uh, access registers by their name right? Or you can access parts of them by partial identifiers. And this is really cool. This reflects the history of uh, the architecture, at least an x86. RAX is the 64-bit x86 uh, register RAX, right? It stands for, I don't remember, but let's say really extended, extended A, right? Now that's because it is the end result of a lot of evolution that keeps growing the word width of the architecture. Back in the old Intel 8085 days, the 8085 was a 8-bit architecture that had a register A. When the 8085 was evolved into the 8086 by Intel, it became a 16-bit uh, register called A Extended, AX. You could re uh, reference the individual parts of AX, the, the individual bits, uh, of, uh, sorry, the individual bytes of these this two byte 16 bit register with AH and AL, right? So AL was the old A, AH was tacked onto it to make AX. When Intel created 386, or 286, I guess, maybe even 186, I don't know that for sure. Um, they extended the 16-bit register AX into the 32-bit register extended AX. 
and when and and you could still reference the old smaller parts of it and when amd six and uh, when amd extended intel's x86 into amd64 the modern 64-bit x86 architecture they really stretched eax into rax 64-bit okay um Every register on x86 can be partially referenced, but only these old historic ones can you get at that that old uh, second bit from the second byte from the right. Um, but all of them you can get at the rightmost byte, at the rightmost two bytes, the rightmost four bytes, and the full eight byte 64 bit register. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so. That's registers, they hold data, but how do we put data in them? Well, we do so with an assembly instruction, move. We just say, hey, move the number OX539 into RAX, and we write it like this. Move RAX comma 539, the same way that you write X equals seven or something, right, in, uh, in, 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 in a math class. The flow of data is in your screen, that way, right? It goes from from one three three seven to rex or rbx in the second line, right? They both get set to the same value. One value is specified in hexadecimal. The equivalent value on the next line is in decimal. All right. Data that's specified directly in an assembly instruction. So I guess this is the first assembly instruction you've fully seen. Super simple, right? It just puts the number one three three seven into rex. Um, data that is specified like that, number 137, is called an immediate value. So it takes an immediate, 137, puts it in the register, RAX. You can also, of course, of course, we talked about partial registers. Well, you can access those. You can say, hey, move uh, 5 into AH, and then move hex 39 into AL, which will create hex 539 in RAX, which is 1337. Super cool. All right, be careful. One thing. You can access AH, you can access AL, very independent of each other, and they'll all just go to into the, their respective bits of uh, RAX. If you touch EAX, the 32-bit part of RAX, the rightmost 32 bits, it's gonna zero out the rest of the register. All right, believe it or not, this is done for performance reasons that are very complicated should take computer architecture if you're interested, um, but it will happen and it'll screw you up and um, it actually makes writing 32-bit code in 64-bit context a little tricky because if you touch a uh, address, which tends to, anyways, we're getting ahead of ourselves. If you touch EAX, REX will be clobbered. If you touch EBX, the, 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 then the top 32 bits of RBX will be clobbered, and so on. All right, now, how do you uh, shunt data around? Well, you move between instructions in the same way that you can move hex 539 into RAX. This line, move RBX, comma RAX, moves the data from RAX into RBX. Now, I say move, I mean copy. The old data is not destroyed. Um, so it's a weird, little bit of a, a weird caveat. I think they opt, uh, really optimized for this move because then it doesn't make sense. How do you copy an immediate value? I guess you could, but anyways, uh, move does not destroy the source of the move. It just copies that data into the destination. The destination is on the left. The source is on the right. And you can also move between the partial registers uh, as long as the sizes line up because uh, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, you can move into the, the, the partial registers um, and it looks the same. Just keep in mind, anytime you write to EBX, the remaining 32-bit or any of the lower 32-bit of the registers, the remaining 32-bit, uh, the, the high 32-bits of that register will be zeroed out. Don't let it screw you up. All right. Now, let's say you wanted to uh, uh, actually extend. You wanted to move negative 1 into EAX, but you wanted that to be like, you know, uh, actual negative one in 64-bit land. By default, it's not. By default, when you look at it, if you move negative one to EAX, that's F, 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 F. Maybe that was the right number of Fs in uh, um, uh, 
2's complement, that's both this 4.29 billion and negative 1. But Rax, since the top bits are all zeroed out, it's only that high number. It is not 0, 1 anymore. That's a bummer. Not great. If we are doing some math and then we, we start in on the 32-bit stuff and then we need to access those same values in 64-bit, this could really ruin our day. If you want to extend that negative 1 into 64-bit negative 1, there's another instruction that basically says move and sign extend. It'll move the thing and then it'll look if it's negative and it'll put ones everywhere to make the remaining number zero. With that, with move sx, rax, eax, right? So you move negative one to eax, the uh, left 32 bits of rax are zeroed out. And then you take eax and you move sign extend it into rax. That's taking the register and moving it into itself. Totally valid. It'll sign extend preserve the two's complement value and give you your beautiful 64-bit negative one. Very cool. All right, just now you know, if you were ever curious. All right. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> you can move a lot of data, or you can, you can do a lot of operations on data in registers. Here is just some of the many cool things you can do. You can add. You can subtract, you can increment and decrement. That's add one and subtract one. Uh, it, there's a lot of these sort of little like helper instructions that aren't strictly necessary. Obviously you could just add Rx one instead of ink Rx, but here we are. Um, you can or X or shift left and right. And, and, and you know, you, you can read more and more and more. Um, it, actually, there's a really cool tool called Repel. <coughs> it's pre-installed in the Phone College Dojo. Um, it just allows you to write assembly and it'll uh, uh, just run that binary and show you how the register changed. Very cool stuff. All right. A lot of things you can do. One neat instruction that's not on here that I realized should be on here. Exchange. X, C, H, G. Exchange. You give it two registers and it swaps their values. Very cool. All right. Awesome. So a lot of things you can do arithmetically on registers. All right, some registers you can't or shouldn't do stuff to. For example, RIP, which is the address of the next instruction. We'll actually talk about how to get at um, uh, value, at, at, at the, that value and how to uh, change it and so forth. Don't worry about it yet. Um, another special register, RSP, it contains the address of uh, a special region called the stack in memory. Don't worry about that yet. We'll talk about it in the next lecture. And there are other registers that are used but for important things that uh, we'll also talk about it later. But, you know, generally speaking, registers are cool. You can use them to compute. There are also a lot of other crazy registers. I think I've mentioned this several times um, in terms of registers that are used for big data crunching. There are also special registers that are used by the operating system itself. Um, We'll talk about this in later modules. It's going to be mind-blowing, super exciting stuff um, brought to you by, well, I guess, Intel registers and viewers like you. See you next time.